we're going to begin section two of chapter 11, and we'll start out with just talking about the different types of chemical reaction that are out there. Chemical reactions produce one or more new materials that have different chemical and physical properties from the original substance or substances. Things that indicate that a chemical reaction has occurred are things like formation of a gas, a change in color, forming a precipitate, and a precipitate just means a solid that's formed and settles out of solution during a reaction. Or other changes in properties such as when marble forms a crumbly solid as it's exposed to acid rain, or iron rusts when exposed to water and air. Chemical reactions also involve changes in energy. There are endothermic reactions and exothermic reactions. Endo means into, basically, so energy gets absorbed from the surroundings as an endothermic reaction occurs. So that would result in a temperature drop in the surrounding medium. Exothermic reaction means that heat gets released as the reaction occurs. This produces an increase in temperature in the surrounding medium instead. So there's endothermic and there are exothermic reactions, and you should be able to identify those. Chemical reactions occur when chemical bonds break and when new bonds formed, and these reactions involve a rearrangement of atoms. Reactions can usually be classified into one of five different categories depending upon how these atoms rearrange to form new substances. The five basic categories are synthesis, which are sometimes also called direct combination reactions. Decomposition is another. Synthesis and decomposition are essentially opposites from one another. Then there's also single replacement and double replacement reactions. And finally, combustion. Each of these categories of reactions has basic characteristics of reactants and products, which helps us to figure out which category a reaction would fit into. A synthesis reaction involves two or more reactants that combine to form only one product. So one of the telltale signs of synthesis is you end up with only one thing when you had more than that to begin with. So it can be recognized by a basic reaction formula of A plus B makes AB. An example of one of these reactions is where we have our A and our B, this time are hydrogen molecules and oxygen molecules, which when they react, will react to form just one new product, which is water. And so you'll see here that these molecules break apart and form new molecules as the reaction takes place. You started with two hydrogen molecules and one oxygen molecule, but ended up with two water molecules in the end. So we have a single product formed from two different reactants. Our next video shows the reaction of aluminum and bromine to form aluminum bromide, which would follow this basic reaction equation. So as you can see, we have aluminum on the left and bromine on the right. They're going to pour bromine into this beaker, which readily vaporizes, producing that noxious gas. And now they're going to take some aluminum that's in that watch glass, and they're going to dump that in there so that reaction can occur. Once the two are mixed together, it takes just a little bit, and then the reaction will begin. When the reaction begins, you can see a lot of heat and light energy that's given off in the process. You can also see a vaporized product that's kind of like a white vapor that's coming out from underneath the edge of the watch glasses. This is being created. Some of that vapor deposits on that watch glass. So if you move the watch glass, you can see the vapor has condensed to form a solid on the watch glass. And they'll show you that that's the case as they scrape some of this off using a scupula. So you can see some of the white solid being removed. That's that aluminum bromide that was formed.
Our next video shows the reaction of sodium metal with chlorine gas, and that will form sodium chloride. So you can see they're heating up the sodium metal, which will make the reaction take place more quickly. They've got it in a deflagration spoon, and so they're going to put that in there, and that hot metal reacts very quickly with that noxious chlorine gas that's green in there, and it starts producing a lot of heat and light of its own as this reaction takes place. So this is definitely what we would call an exothermic reaction because although we got it, gave it a little energy to get it started, once it got started, it produced a lot of heat and light energy of its own. And here's the spoon with a deposit of white powdery material inside of it, which of course is the sodium chloride that was created as the sodium metal that was in the spoon reacted with the chlorine gas that surrounded it. So to summarize, a synthesis reaction takes two reactants or more, such as potassium metal and chlorine gas, as shown here, allows them to come into contact and undergo reaction, as we see in the middle, producing some heat and some light in that middle picture. And at the right, we end up with this Florence flask that's coated with a white powdery solid, which is the potassium chloride salt that's been created. So that would be an example of uh, two reactants coming together to form one product, synthesis or direct combination to form something new. Now decomposition does the exact opposite of that. It involves one reactant breaking down to form two or more products. And it can be recognized by your basic reaction formula of starting with AB, it breaks down into A and B. This graphic gives a very general idea of what's going on. You start with one compound as shown here, and it breaks down into two different simpler substances. Those simpler substances could be elemental or they could be compounds themselves or a combination of the two. Now we're going to see a demonstration animation of when copper one hydrogen carbonate gets heated and it breaks down into simpler substances. We see copper two hydrogen carbonate here and what happens is we're going to heat it up going to zoom in and see what's supposed to be happening at the atomic or molecular level. And we can see that what happens is we see water and carbon dioxide being produced as that breaks down into simpler substances, leaving some possibly some copper behind that's not pictured here. Here's another decomposition reaction. This is where mercury 2 oxide breaks down into elemental mercury as well as oxygen gas. And so we can see the balanced equation is 2HGO breaks down to make two atoms of HG and one molecule of O2. Here we see another decomposition reaction where we start with a more complex molecule peroxide, and that hydrogen peroxide breaks down such that the hydrogens join together and the oxygens join together to produce a molecule of hydrogen and a molecule of oxygen. So it's a decomposition once again because we start with one reactant and end with two or more products. Single replacement reactions is the third type that we're going to look at. They involve an elemental reactant displacing an element from a compound and it's going to form two new products. We'll have a new elemental substance and we'll have a new compound as well. So as you can see in this reaction, we start with an element represented here by A and a compound represented with BX. And that A displaces the B from the compound, so we now have a compound of AX and we now have B in its element form, so we have AX plus B as our products. Now this animation shows how zinc that normally forms a 2 plus cation can actually form a 1 plus cation as in this example. And so what we have here is two zincs combining with two hydrochloric acid molecules. And what you see at the end is two zinc chloride molecules. And you can see an H2 molecule going off as a product as well. Let's watch that one more time. If zinc forms a 2 plus cation instead, 
then it would react according to this reaction, where zinc combines with two hydrochloric acid molecules to form zinc, chlor zinc chloride and hydrogen. So in this case, we're starting with the element zinc and the compound hydrochloric acid. We end with the element hydrogen and the compound zinc chloride. Another example of a single replacement reaction is when iron reacts with copper to sulfate. The iron will displace the copper and that results in the formation of a new compound, iron to sulfate. And you also get elemental copper in the process. So an element and a compound react to form a different element with a new compound. Now, something you have to consider when you're looking at single replacement reactions is will that replacement actually occur as it's written? Not all single replacement reactions will occur just because they look good on paper. A metal may or may not replace another metal in a compound. It depends upon which metal is more reactive. Scientists have investigated the relative reactivities of many different metals and have come up with what we call an activity series of metals. It's just a list of the metals that shows the more reactive ones listed towards the top. So metals are listed from top to bottom in order of decreasing reactivity. Things at the top are very reactive, ones at the bottom are not as reactive. A reactive metal will replace any metal listed below it in the series because it's more reactive than that one. Note that hydrogen is also included in the list even though we don't normally classify it as a metal. Hydrogen behaves like a metal when it's bound to a nonmetal or to a polyatomic anion so it needs to be included in this list. Although it's not nearly as reactive as many of these other metals from lithium through lead, those are all a lot more reactive than hydrogen. But hydrogen will replace copper or mercury or silver because hydrogen is more reactive than those. So this reaction looks really good here. ZnCl2 plus H2 makes Zn plus 2HCl. We see the atoms are all there. It balances out just fine. But this reaction will not occur the direction it's written because zinc is more reactive than hydrogen, so it wants to displace hydrogen. Hydrogen cannot displace it in the compound because hydrogen is not as reactive as zinc. Now, halogens are not metals, but halogens can also be placed in a series of reactivity. One halogen can displace another halogen from a compound. A halogen can displace any halogen listed lower in the table because these are also ranked from top to bottom in order of decreasing reactivity. So fluorine can replace chlorine, bromine, and iodine, but iodine will not replace any of the above three. Chlorine will replace bromine and iodine. Bromine can replace just iodine. So if we consider this halogen activity table, we need to answer the question, which of these reactions will be able to occur? Because if you look carefully, they're the same reaction, just one is written in reverse of the other. So we have to ask ourselves, is iodine more reactive than bromine? Because if it is, the first reaction will occur. Or is bromine more reactive than iodine? In which case, it will displace iodine from that compound. So we look at the table and bromine's listed further to the top, which means it's the more active, and it's going to replace anything that comes below it, such as iodine. So we know that it's the second reaction that actually will take place, not the first.